chapter 2. You'll be familiar with this passage, uh, verses 8 through 10. If I've quoted it one time in the 13 years I've been here, I've probably quoted it 200 times or more. Uh, it is a defining passage. It tells us how we're saved, how we're not saved, and what we, this is not good English grammar, but what we're saved for. You're not supposed to leave a preposition dangling at the end of a sentence, but it makes the point. All right, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, then Ephesians 4, 1 through 3. Stand with me if you would and follow along. I, we have these texts on our screen. Certainly follow along in your Bible. Uh, Ephesians 2. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. In Ephesians 4, 1 to 3. I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. What have we just read together? We've read the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And I hope you recognize if, you, if you're familiar with Paul's letters, we went through Ephesians a few years back, did a thorough study of that. Ephesians 1, two, 1 through 3 uh, talks about some doctrinal matters. 4 through 6, practical. And so you pick that up in chapter, I urge you therefore, in other words, in the light of what I've said, that you walk worthy. And so you have this doctrinal, practical model that Paul often employs in his letters. May we see that tonight. May we see Jesus and know what manner of men and women we ought to be in times like these. Thank you. Please be seated. I want to read to you again, just because we may not have read it in a while, John 5, 39 and 40, Jesus himself speaking to the, to the religious leaders, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. In other words, if, as, you, as you search the scriptures, you will find the way to have eternal life. And it's they that bear witness about me. In other words, Jesus is saying, I'm, I'm the way you find eternal life. Yet you refuse to come to me in order that you may have life. Let's, uh, let's watch the Bible Project's video of uh, Ephesians. Paul's letter to the Ephesians. The story of how Paul came to the city of Ephesus is really interesting. You can go read about it in Acts chapter 19. Ephesus was a huge city. It was the epicenter of worship for most of the Greek and Roman gods. And for over two years, Paul had a really effective missionary presence there, and lots of people became followers of Jesus. Years later, after being imprisoned by the Romans, Paul wrote this letter. The movement of thought in the letter divides into two really clear halves. In the first half, Paul is exploring the story of the gospel, how all history came to its climax in Jesus and in his creation of this multi-ethnic community of his followers. The second half of the letter is linked to the first by the word, therefore. And here Paul explores how the gospel story should affect how we live every part of our life story personally, in our neighborhoods and communities, and in our families. So let's dive in, and we can see how Paul develops all of this. Chapter 1 opens with a beautiful Jewish-style poem, where Paul praises God the Father for the amazing things that he has done in Christ Jesus. From eternity past, the Father has purposed to choose and bless a covenant people. And think here, the family of Abraham and Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. And through Jesus now, anyone can be adopted into that family. Jesus' death covers our worst sins, our worst failures, and in Jesus we find God's grace. In fact, Paul says, that grace has opened up a whole new way for us to understand every part of our lives. He says in chapter 1, verse 10, that God's purpose was to unify all things in heaven and on earth under Christ, which is a title that means Messiah. 
God's plan was always to have a huge family of restored human beings who are unified in Jesus the Messiah. This divine purpose became clear, Paul says, when we were first made into that family. And here he's referring to ethnic Jews in the family of Abraham. But then Paul talks about how you, and here he means non-Jews, you all heard about Jesus and the salvation through him. And you were also brought into this family by the work of the Holy Spirit. And so here he's referring to the events told in the stories of Acts about how God's Spirit brought together Jew and non-Jew into one family in Jesus. It's just like God promised to Abraham long ago. Notice also how in this poem, Paul begins by talking about God the Father, but then about Jesus the Son, and then here at the end about the Spirit. All three work together as Paul tells the story of the Gospel. It's really cool. After the poem, Paul responds with a prayer. He prays that these followers of Jesus would not just know about but personally experience the power of the Gospel. That they would be energized by the same power that raised Jesus from the dead and placed him as the exalted head of the whole world. Now in chapter 2, Paul goes back and he elaborates on some key ideas from the poem in chapter 1, especially God's grace and this new multi-ethnic family of Jesus. He begins by retelling the story of how these non-Jewish Christians came to know Jesus. Before hearing about Jesus, they were physically alive, but they were spiritually dead. They were trapped in a purposeless life of selfishness and sin, and they were deceived by dark spiritual forces of evil. But amazingly, God in his great love and mercy, he saved them, he forgave all of their sins, and he joined their lives to Jesus's resurrection life, and he's brought them back to life too. And so now, having been created as new human beings through Jesus, they have the joy of discovering all of the new calling and purposes and tasks that God has set before them. Not only have they been shown God's grace, they've also been invited into a new family. Before hearing about Jesus, these non-Jewish people, they were not just cut off from God, they were cut off from his covenant people, the family of Abraham. And for a really practical reason, the commands of the Sinai covenant, they formed like a boundary line around the family. They were like a barrier that kept most non-Jewish people away. But in Jesus, the laws of the Torah have been fulfilled and the barrier is removed. The two ethnic groups have become, as Paul puts it, a new unified humanity that can live together in peace. So Paul goes on in chapter 3 to marvel at the unique role that he got to have in spreading this good news to non-Jewish people. And even though he's in prison, he's thanking God for the chance he's had to see this covenant family grow so huge. So Paul closes the first half of the letter with another prayer. This time he prays that Jesus' followers would be strengthened by God's Spirit to simply grasp and comprehend the love that Christ has for his people. The second half of the letter begins with Paul shifting gears and he starts challenging the reader to respond to the gospel story by how they live their own life story. So he starts in chapter 4 with just the everyday life of the church. The church is a big family with lots of different kinds of people, but he emphasizes that they are one. And one is a key word in this chapter. They are one body that's unified by one spirit. They have one Lord with one faith. They have one baptism. They believe in one God. That's a lot of unity. However, Paul says unity is not the same thing as uniformity. He goes on to explore how Jesus' new family consists of lots of very, very different kinds of people, but they're all empowered by the one Holy Spirit, each using their unique talents and passions to serve and to love each other and to build up the church. And here he uses two really cool metaphors. One is building up the church as a new temple, and the second is that they are all becoming a new humanity with Jesus as the head. And this new humanity is a metaphor he's going to then run with for the next couple chapters. Paul challenges every Christian to take off their old humanity, like a set of old clothes, and to put on their new humanity, in which the image of God is being restored. And he then goes on into this long section where he compares this new and old humanity. So instead of lying, new humans speak truth. Instead of harboring anger, they peacefully resolve their conflicts. Instead of stealing, new humans are generous. Instead of gossiping, they encourage people with their words. Instead of getting revenge, new humans forgive. Instead of gratifying every sexual impulse, new humans cultivate self-control of their bodily desires. Instead of getting drunk, new humans come under the influence of God's Spirit. And he spells out what that influence looks like in four different ways. 
The first two have to do with singing, singing together, but also singing alone. And this is really interesting that the first thing that Paul thinks of about how the Spirit works in the lives of Jesus' people is singing and music. The third sign of the Spirit's influence is being thankful for everything. And the fourth is that the Spirit will compel Jesus' followers to put themselves underneath others and to elevate others as more important than themselves. And Paul actually expands on this fourth point by showing how it works in Christian marriage. So you have a wife who follows Jesus. She is called to respect and to allow her husband to become responsible for her. And the husband is called to love his wife and to use his responsibility to lay down his selfish agenda and to prioritize his wife's well-being above his own. And Paul says it's this kind of marriage that's actually reenacting the gospel story. The husband's actions mimic Jesus and his love and his self-sacrifice. The wife's actions mimic the church, which allows Jesus to love her and to make her new. Paul then applies the same idea to children and parents as well as slaves and masters. Paul closes out the letter by reminding these Christians of the reality of spiritual evil. These are beings and forces that will try to undermine the unity of Jesus' people and to compromise their new humanity. And so Paul challenges them to stand firm and to put on this metaphorical set of body armor, which he describes in detail. And Paul has drawn all of these pieces of body armor from the book of Isaiah and how Isaiah depicted the Messianic king. And so now, as the Messiah's followers, we need to make the Messiah's attributes our own since we make up Jesus's body. Practically, I think Paul means for Christians to begin to form habits, proactively using prayer and the scriptures and our relationships with each other to help us grow and mature as followers of Jesus. And that's the letter to the Ephesians. Very powerful. It's where Paul summarizes the whole gospel story and how it should reshape every part of our life story. I think this is one of the best descriptives that they've, they've given, and they've given many good ones, but this one is uh, very creative with the graphics and really make an impression as you watch that. Okay, Ephesians is addressed to a group of believers who are, who are Paul says, are indescribably rich in Jesus Christ, but they're living uh, what would be called a beggarly existence because they, they're ignorant of the spiritual wealth that is theirs. And they've not appropriated that wealth, so they're walking around like spiritual paupers. And so Paul challenges them at this point. And when you look at an outline of the survey of Galatians, it was written from Rome, we believe, a time of writing about 61 AD. We'll get into that a little more uh, later on. Uh, it breaks down into two main areas. First of all, the position of the Christian. This is the who he is, what, what faith means, and the privileges that are ours because of who we are in Christ. And by the way, when we get in Christ, is going to come up about 35 times in this letter, more than anywhere else in the New Testament, in Christ, in Christ. Um, when you break down this number one, uh, the main position of the Christian, you have the praise for redemption, which is that uh, he called it a three, a three uh, stanza poem. It's typically regarded as a three stanza hymn, an early hymn of the church. We'll look at that a little more. A prayer for revelation, uh, where we've looked at this, by the way, on Wednesday nights as we're going through the prayers of the Apostle Paul. And then uh, position of the Christian, who, who you are because of the privileges you have in Christ. And then a prayer for the realization of, of all that that means to you. The second part of the book, uh, beginning in chapter 4, is a practice. So the position of the Christian and the practice of the Christian. Uh, this has to do with his behavior. Not so much belief as behavior. If you want to think about categories, it's, it's belief is orthodoxy. All right? Behavior is orthopraxy. It's how you practice what you believe. And it speaks in, to the responsibilities of the Christian. Uh, there's emphasis on the unity in the church, the holiness of life personally, responsibilities, the, re the role relationships at home and at work. Don't get hung up on slave master. That was the context. You can, when you read through this, you ought to be able to see employer, employee, supervisor, laborer. The, the principle is the same, although it would not be as drastic as slave and master. In most cases, in some cases, folks say, oh, you, don't, you don't know where I work. 
It's just like slave and master. But I understand what you're saying there. All right. Then the, the conduct we should have in conflict. There will be conflict. Jesus says, in this world you will have trouble. He says this in John's gospel. In this world you will be squeezed. That's the word for trouble. Be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. So Paul talks about how in Christ we are given uh, all that we need for life and godliness. And there's this, this analogy of armor. We're equipped to withstand the fiery darts of the enemy. If you want to Dig into that a little more in a paragraph uh, outline of that, of that survey. Uh, you, you pick up this walk worthy of the calling. Look at Ephesians 4, 1. I, therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. So you've been called. Remember the word called is the word summoned. You have, uh, if you've not, it's not just an invitation. You can, it's not like somebody sends you an invitation to a birthday party and says, I can't go. Now, this is a summons. This comes from a judge. You must go. To fail to go is to face judicial consequences. This walk with a worthiness, walk befitting that, walk reflecting the high calling that we have in Christ Jesus, uh, to which you've been called. Ephesians 2.10, of course, because... We are his workmanship. Remember that word workmanship is the Greek word poiema. You hear in that what word poem. That may be why the, why the, uh, the authors of this, this Bible project on Ephesians key in on the idea of a poem. Your poem. We're his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for or unto good works. We are, we're not saved by works. We are saved by to unto good works. And it's interesting, we, we would say here, well, the Lord has, in eternity past, set his heart upon a people to save them. Yes, he has. In eternity past, he has set his heart upon a people to, to cultivate in their lives. The Lord has be prepared beforehand that we should walk in them, preparing that for us, preparing that revealed in the word to tell us what pleasing him looks like. The... Uh, the position uh, has to do with, with the, the act of the Trinity. Let's look at that a minute. This hymn to the praise of God's grace. It's in Ephesians 1, uh, verses 3 through 14. I just want to show you the, uh, the in fact. Let's read that. Let's just take a moment and read this. If you've not read this in a while. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ, notice this, in Christ there, with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that, there's a purpose clause, in order that we should be holy and blameless before him. And this, depending on the translation you have, the, the, then the sentence may continue before him in love. Other translations break it off at before him, beginning the next sentence, in love. He predestined us for adoption. The word predestined, remember, is not a word to run away from. It's simply the Greek word pro horizo. Pro is for, you ought to hear horizon in horizo. He has marked out a boundary. He set horizons around us, if you please. Uh, for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace. There's the refrain. That stanza one. All right? We'll see this and break it down in a minute here. <clears throat> Which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will. Oh, I'm sorry, I jumped over. With which he has blessed us in the beloved, in Jesus. In him, that is in the beloved, verse 7, we have redemption, the word redemption. We've been bought out of the slave market through his blood. The, you should know this. I think I've mentioned this, but if I haven't, blood, when you read about blood related to Christ, it's his death. It's not the, it's not the red liquid. It's, blood is a shorthand for his death. It was a bloody death. When you, when you read about blood being substituted for death, it is a it is a horrendous death. It's not a death of natural causes. That is sleep, all right, very often. Okay, through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. There you see that. 
which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will. According to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, there's that in Christ again, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven, things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we might be to the praise of his glory. You see that? There's that refrain again. In him you also, verse 13, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, notice the synonym here, the word of truth. When you hear the word of truth, you're hearing the gospel which, which brings salvation to you and believed in him. You were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. So now you see God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee, the guarantee if you've ever dealt with a purchase, a major purchase, you, you put down earnest money, particularly on a house, it's your, it's your demonstration that you're sincere about buying this, you're not going to have the uh, owner take it off the market and then lose another sale. You, you put down earnest money, the guarantee. The Spirit is our guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. You see that threefold refrain, all right? Let's, let's just look at it now a little bit here. This hymn praises God the Father for choosing us, Ephesians 1, 3 to 6, we just read that. Praises Christ the Son for redeeming us, verses 7 to 12. And praises the Spirit for sealing us. The idea of being sealed is, it's a, if you were to receive in, in Jesus' day a document of importance, and it came from someone of importance, it would have their seal on it as proof of ownership. When we are sealed, which we, it shows that we have proof that we belong to God. And again, I'll just point out to you, in case you missed it, these three uh, refrains concerning the Father, verse 6, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. The Son, Ephesians 1, 12, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. And concerning the Spirit, verse 14, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So there's that threefold, and, and again, many scholars believe this was an early hymn of the church, of the, just like we sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs that Paul taught the believers, having been inspired to write this, taught them to sing this as a part of their worship. Then, of course, he, he prays for them. Uh, he prays uh, that, they, that they would uh, recognize who they are, the eyes enlightened, so that they may come to perceive what is true of them because they're in Christ. He talks about God's grace. You're saved. Uh, that chapter 2 is, is wonderful. He talks about how the wrath of God. You, you were under him. We were all by children in nature of wrath. But God, my, my mentor, R.F. Gates, I think I told you this before, in his office in Shreveport, when you walked into his office, uh, over his desk was this plaque, but God, but God. No matter what the situation is, but God, who is rich in mercy, wherein he has, has, has loved us. And he launches into this marvelous, uh, in fact, let's read that because it's, when you, when you, it's almost like he can't contain himself. Pick this up. And you were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Notice the shifting of the metaphor there. You were dead. You walked in, in this spiritual death. Following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. That's what you call the unconverted. They're sons and daughters of disobedience. That, that marks them out. Among whom we all once lived. So it's not like he's putting them down. In the passions of our flesh 
carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and we're by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. It's universal. It's like, like you're reading Romans here. All have sinned, coming short of the glory of God. But God, who is being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, that's, that's Romans 5. While we were yet sinners, Christ died made us alive together with Christ. And he can't, he can't keep it back. By grace you've been saved. <laughs> He's getting to that, but you've got to say it. By grace you've been saved. You don't deserve it. Children of wrath, you deserve wrath. And he raised us up he, in, in mid-sentence. As he's talking about that we, we were brought to life by, by Christ and raised, up, raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. There it is again. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. And here he gets to verse 8. He couldn't contain it a while ago. For by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. Didn't originate with us. It is the gift of God. I've told you this before. If you were to diagram this and you look for the antecedent. For by grace you've been saved through faith. Uh, the King James and that not of yourselves. Or it is not of, it's not of your own doing. It is the gift of God. What is it? Well, the, the law of antecedents says you go back to the most, to the closest at hand statement of reality. It's not of your own doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of work. So the whole thing, salvation, grace, faith, all are gifts of God. That diagrams out in the Greek. It's not a, it's not, it's initially or even essentially a theological statement. It is a grammatical statement based upon how you would diagram this. The gift of God, not a result of work so that no one may boast. No one can say, well, I tried harder. I studied harder. I was more sincere. I was more serious. I believe, no. No ground of boasting. Paul, Paul would say, to the Corinthians, God forbid that I should glory except in the cross. And I've been crucified to the world in it. For we are his workmanship. Again, we looked at that a while ago. So you have this, this wonderful statement about salvation that comes by grace to Jews and Gentiles alike. The second prayer expresses his desire that the readers be strengthened with the power of the Spirit and fully apprehend the love of Christ. So that you may know, first, first prayer, be illumined to see these things. Second, that you may be strengthened and apprehend. And then, of course, the practice in the second, the second uh, part of the, of the letter. As Paul emphasized in the book of Romans, behavior does not determine blessing. That's a, that's a works mentality. Do this, do this, do this, God will bless you. Instead, blessing, realizing the blessing that is ours by grace should determine behavior. It is living a life of gratitude to God. And when we're not doing that, we're demonstrating that we're really not plugged into, we've really not embraced or rather had, had been embraced by the reality of salvation by grace. We don't really understand it as we should. Then of course the emphasis on unity, uh, the emphasis on relationships. The fifth commandment, if you're, if you're familiar with the Ten Commandments, the fifth commandment says, honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God gives you. And in the Puritans understood as they, as they just uh, exploded the Ten Commandments to the duties enjoined and the sins forbidden. They recognized that in the Fifth Commandment you have the connection for every relationship in life. They would say it this way. You have the relationship of superiors to inferiors, those in authority to those under their authority. Uh, parents to children. They would say you have the relationship of inferiors to superiors, how we're to relate to those in authority over us. And all of us are there, by the way. There's no son of Adam, no daughter of Eve on this planet who is not accountable to someone, to some authority. People live like they're not, but they just, they're demonstrating a, a, a hatred for God's uh, rule and reign. 
or in ignorance of it. So superiors to inferiors, inferiors to superiors. Then they would say, and then there's also the relationship of equals one to another. So in the marriage relationship, what you have is you have the husband in authority, the wife under his submission, and yet you also have them mutually submitting in Ephesians 5 to one another out of reverence for Christ. So you have these dynamics in relationships. Paul touches on this. In fact, when he gets to Ephesians 6, what does he say to children in Ephesians 6? Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. What's he doing there? He's simply citing the fifth commandment as it applies to how we relate. How, how to, and f- honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. Fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but raise them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. He's talking about these relationship dynamics here, and, and grace informs that. Then he closes out the letter with a benediction. So we'll shift gears a little bit to the introduction and title of Ephesians itself. I want you to see in 1 through 3, chapters 1 through 3, this heavenly, what one writer called a heavenly bank account. When he says that he's, he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus, what does he say about that in chapters 1 through 3? Well, look at these. We have adoption. In the, in the world of the, of the first century, by the way, this is also true in Louisiana. Louisiana is under Napoleonic law, a European law. In Louisiana, if you adopt a child, legally you cannot ever disown that child. That's not true in, in, in English law in different states. But we lived in Louisiana and understood the, the Napoleonic Code that superimposed upon that French uh, Canadian influence there. That's true in Europe, this is the, the first century world. If you adopted a child, you took a child who was not biologically yours, you could never disown that child. And so when the scripture speaks of our being adopted, that's powerful. We weren't, we weren't biologically grafted into the family of God, but we've been adopted. And so it raises us to a status that can never be revoked. Uh, this acceptance, being accepted in Jesus Christ. By nature, God rejects us. His wrath insists, his wrath and righteousness insists that he reject us and hold us under condemnation. But because of Jesus Christ, we're accepted, we're received, we're embraced. I taught at a place years ago in a conference and, we, and looked at the gospel, how the gospel has been turned upside down. We talked, we say, well, have you accepted Jesus? The, the question in the scripture is, has he accepted you? Have you been accepted in the beloved? That's what the scripture emphasizes. And then redemption, that word, we've been redeemed, purchased, it's the word, bought by precious blood. We've been forgiven. Don't let the devil cause you to walk around like, like a hung dog with, with just all down and moping. You've been forgiven. And God doesn't change his mind. He's forgiven you for the sake of Christ. He's given us wisdom. We talked about that. The, the ability to know and to apply what we know. Now, if we're, not, if we're not exercising that, that's our sin. But we're given that in Christ, okay? The next thing we're given. We have an inheritance. It will be un- incorrupted. It's not going to fade. It's not going to devalue. You know, we, we get things here on earth and they devalue. Buy a new car, drive it off the lot, go back the next day and try to get back what you paid for it. Can't do it. That's why if you've ever seen the bumper sticker, no one drives a new car. <laughs> Once you get in it and drive it, it devalues, right? Our inheritance does not devalue. The seal of the Spirit, this mark of ownership, he's given us life. We were dead in trespasses and sins, and we, Christ is our life, and he's given us life. And then grace. Grace is, is, is God uh, treating us in a way that we don't deserve. And then citizenship. Yes, we happen to be citizens of the greatest nation on the face of the earth, but we have another citizenship far better because it's in a place ruled by a king who is completely righteous. No frauds in heaven, no, uh, no scandals in heaven. We're citizens of the kingdom. And these things constitute, when Paul says he's given us every spiritual blessing, 
in Christ Jesus. Every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. These things and more. And we live, we should live to the praise of his glorious grace. The traditional title of, of Ephesians is the, is the pros, you should be recognized, pros, P-R-O-S, uh, Ephesios, for or to the Ephesians. That's the preposition there. Now, he, scholars are divided as to whether or not this was a letter written primarily or exclusively to the church at Ephesus or whether it was written to the church at Ephesus primarily with the intention that it, be, it become an encyclical, that it be circulated. Uh, part of the reason for that uh, is that there's not, if you read this letter, it's not like the letter to the Galatians, which itself was to be circulated to the churches in Asia Minor, the Galatian province. There's not, not a lot of personal references here. Paul is not addressing a controversy to the church at Ephesus, uh, not, not dealing with particular problems. The formal tone of the letter, it's not, it doesn't tell you have the personal flavor that, uh, that you would expect in a letter, particularly when you read in Acts where he met with the Ephesian elders at Miletus. And he told them, you're not going to see me ever again. And they begin, it's beautiful, if you go back and read Acts 20, they begin to cling to him begging him. He has to tear himself from them. He was clearly endeared to these leaders and to the church at Ephesus. But you don't pick that up in this letter so much, which makes you, makes you wonder if indeed written to Ephesus, it was designed to be sort of a, uh, have a general use of instruction about who we are in Christ and how we're to behave in Christ to the churches uh, of that area. In addition to there not being any terms of endearment, there's a phraseology that's, that's fascinating. Uh, look at me at Ephesians 1.15. I'm not sure that I have this up on a slide. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. I've heard about it. After I heard of your faith. He's not, it's, it's almost like it's, it's got a distance there that's, that's not personal. And so people have concluded that perhaps, uh, one writer said that when you consider all of Paul's writings, the only letters that greet specific people are Romans and Colossians. And both of these were addressed to churches he had not visited, by the way. We'll see that when we get to Colossae. Some scholars accept an ancient tradition that Ephesians is Paul's letter to the Laodiceans. I don't know that I will go that far, but they may have been included in the intention. Look at Col Colossians 4.16 with me. And when this letter has been read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans and see that you also read the letter from Laodicea. What's he talking about there, this letter to the Laodiceans? We don't have it extant unless this uh, is it. It's just no way to be sure. I, would, I land, in case you want to know, I think it was directly addressed to the Ephesians, but written in such a way that it could be helpful and used to the churches in Asia uh, who were desperately in need of con continual apostolic instruction. As far as the author goes, uh, Ephesians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus. And Paul's authorship is not in question by anyone who's, who's a serious conservative Bible scholar. What you'll find if you ever dig into this stuff is there's some liberal out there that's going to question everything. So we don't, we don't count them. <laughs> you know, but I'm talking about serious conservative Bible scholarship. Doesn't question Paul's authorships. Um, the date and setting. At the end of the second missionary journey, Paul visited Ephesus uh, where he left Priscilla and Aquila. If you want to read just a little snippet of this, you can read Acts 19 to get a, uh, get a, that chapter to get a real flavor. But I'll, Acts 18, verses 18 to 21. After this, Paul stayed many days longer, then took leave of the brothers and set sail for Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila. At Sincrea, he had, his, he had cut his hair, for he was under a vow. That's, we won't get into that. That's not the purpose here tonight. It's, it's, a, it's a Nazarite vow. And they came to Ephesus, and he left them there, Aquila and Priscilla, 
But he himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to stay for a longer period, he declined. But on taking leave of them, he said, I will return to you if God wills. And he set sail from Ephesus. Ephesus was just, so you know, it was a strategic commercial center in Asia Minor. Uh, but they had, a, they had a problem with silt filling up uh, in the water. So they had to dig, to dredge a canal to get uh, ships, get across to the harbor. It was a religious center as well, but in the, in the wrong sense of the word. It was famous for the magnificent temple of Diana. The Romans gave the name to Diana. Uh, and the Greek name was Artemis. Uh, it's considered to be one, if you're familiar with architecture, one of the seven wonders of the world, of the ancient world. Look at Acts 19.35. When the town clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, Men of Ephesus, who is there who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is temple keeper of the great Artemis and of the sacred stone that fell from the sky. So they had this myth, the story about how the stone fell from the heavens and they were, that was a sign for them to build this magnificent uh, temple to Artemis. The practice of magic and the local economy were clearly related to this temple. Paul remained in Ephesus for nearly three years on his third missionary journey. Uh, you can again read about that in Acts 19. Uh, and of course, it was here that the people who began to turn to Christ began to burn their, uh, their magic artifacts. And that caused no small problem because that was cutting in on the trade. Uh, that was not well received at all. So the word of God spread as a result of Paul's labors there throughout the province of Asia. Uh, and as I said, he hurt the traffic uh, in magic and images and there was an uproar in the Ephesian theater. So he left for Macedonia, met with the Ephesian elders while on his way to Jerusalem. If you want to read Acts 20, verses 17 to 38, very moving passage there. Ephesus, Ephesians is one of the prison letters or prison epistles. I just want to show you this real quickly. Uh, written during the first Roman imprisonment, which took place between 60 and 62 AD. And so let's, let's look at some of these. Uh, this takes in, you find this in Ephesians and Philippians and Colossians and Philemon. These were all what's called prison letters, if you're familiar with the grouping of the letters in the New Testament. Let's real quickly touch on this. Look at Ephesians 3, 1. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles. He just says, I'm, I'm writing to you as a prisoner. And I'm, I'm a prisoner, by the way, because I've invaded the Roman world of, of the, of the non-Jews preaching the gospel. Ephesians 4.1, I therefore a prisoner for the Lord urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling. Ephesians 6.20, for which I'm an ambassador in chains that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Then in Philippians, Philippians 1.7, it's right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. Philippians 1, 13 and 14, so that it's become known throughout the whole imperial guard. Where would he find the imperial guard? Locked up in Rome. And to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, there's his, his, the way he handled being imprisoned, that very difficult providence, emboldened the brothers, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Then in Colossians, at the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison. Colossians 4.10, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you, and Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have received instruction. If he comes to you, welcome him. And then Colossians 4.18, I, Paul, write this letter, this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. And then Philemon, uh, if you remember, uh, he came across an escaped slave and shared the gospel with him. The Lord saved the slave, and he was sending him back to the slave owner. Philemon's Philemon 19, yet for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Onesimus was the escaped slave. 
found himself with Paul. Paul shared the gospel. The Lord saved him. And so he's going to send him back to Onesiphorus. Philemon 13, I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. And then verse 23, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus sends greetings. So you have these, these prison letters, these things that he wrote from prison, and then in Ephesians, as I said, and you see it is one of those. Uh, we said to you that in Ephesians, Philippians 1.13, he referenced the imperial guard. Philippians 4.22 is instructive about the influence that Paul had while in Rome. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. That is a most astounding statement. That in the eagle's nest itself, the household of Caesar, there were saints serving Caesar, but serving Jesus as well. So Paul's influence was, was incredible. And so you put, you have Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon written about the same time, um, A.D. 60 to 61. We'll just show this to you. Look at Ephesians 6, 21 and 22. So that you all may know how I am and what I'm doing, Tychicus, the, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will tell you everything. I've sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. They were concerned. The Ephesians were. Colossians 4, 7, and 9. Tychicus will tell you all about my activities. He is a beloved brother and faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I've sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. With him, Onesimus. Who's that? That's the slave. Escaped slave who become a Christian. Our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you, they will tell you of everything that has taken place. And then Philippians, we believe, was written about 62 A.D., not long before Paul was released. Well, let's shift gears now. What about the theme and purpose of this letter? Well, it's the believer's responsibility to walk in accordance with his heavenly calling in Christ Jesus. It's life in the body of Christ. How do we live? How do we live? Christianity is not primarily or exclusively a set of ideas. Christianity is a life-changing encounter with a crucified and risen Savior. And truth, he is the way, the truth, and the life. And he speaks truth and he communicated truth. And we are a people of the book, a people of truth, but we are affected by that. And if we're not affected by the book, then we, then we really don't know the truth. And so this Ephesians 4.1, of course, we've read it several times by now. Ephesians was not written to correct specific errors in a local church, as other letters we're familiar with, to prevent, but rather to prevent problems in the church as a whole by encouraging the body of Christ to grow up in Jesus, to grow, to mature. It was written to make believers more aware of their position in Christ, what, what, it, what it meant that they are to be in Christ. Christ. Because if they understand that, it will transform the way that they live. As far as keys to Ephesians, of course, the key phrase is building the body of Christ. Key verses we've already read, chapters, chapter 2, verses 8 to 10, chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. The key chapter is chapter 6, which tells us about this, this armor. Even though the Christian is blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, guess what? We're not in heavenly places yet. <laughs> There's a reason you have struggles here. This is not heaven. Spiritual warfare is still the daily experience of the Christian life while in the world. And chapter 6 gives the best instruction, divine instruction, on how to be strong in the Lord, verse 10, and in the power of his might. And remember, we've talked about this before when we went through Ephesians, to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Paul ransacks the Greek vocabulary to talk about power and strength, withstand uh, in the evil days. And he says that having done all, when the smoke clears, stand. What about Jesus? How do, where do we see Jesus in, in, in Ephesians? 
Well, I said to you earlier, in Christ occurs some 35 times in Ephesians, more than any other New Testament book. Are you in Christ? If, that's the, if you are in Christ, what does that mean? So I want us to see, I'm just going to sample, we're not going to do all 35, I want us to sample what being in Christ means for the believer because it tells us a lot about Jesus that we need to know. First of all, uh, the believer's in Christ. That's the first thing you need to know. He's, when he's saved, Paul says to the Colossians, we're going to get to Colossians, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And people read that and go, well, I have Christ in me. It's a plural, Christ in the midst of all of you. He's talking about the church there, the hope of glory. Is Christ regnant in the church? And yes, when we're saved, by his spirit, Jesus, the spirit of Jesus comes to dwell within us in the new birth. But it's, it's critical in the new birth to understand our position. We are in Christ. So he starts out chapter 1, verse 1, saying that. And then chapter 1, verse 3, that we're seated in the heavenly places in Christ. Do you know, when Jesus said in John 14, I'm going to prepare a place for you. Surely as I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive to myself that where I am, there you may be also. There's a place. If you're a child of God, you're saved by grace through faith, there's a place for you there. No one else will occupy it. It will not, and I, I believe this, I, when you are taken to inhabit that place. It will not be unfinished, nor will it have accumulated dust and aged. You'll be taken to that place as soon as it is fully prepared for you, and you'll inhabit that in the heavenly places. We're seated with Jesus in the heavenly places. You may be a nobody on this earth. You may have Think about Paul. Paul went from being a somebody, the highest, the highest regarded Jewish scholar under his tutors. His, his Gamaliel would have been more highly regarded but in terms of the, of the rising star of Judaism. And he went from being that to being a nobody, a persona non grata in Jewish life. But he was a somebody in heaven. And he wants, he wants the Ephesian believers to know that in the heavenly places in Christ. He's blessed us in Christ Jesus with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. We're chosen in him. Uh, verse 4 of chapter 1. His Jewish kinsmen had rejected him. Swore a vow they would not eat until they had his head on a platter. Gentiles despised him. People in Ephesians hated him because when the gospel came and found entrance in people's lives, they began to burn all their magic scrolls and all their, all their talismans. And that was a serious dent in the, in the economy. They hated him. But he'd been chosen. Doesn't matter what people think of you finally, if you're chosen by God, Adopted, I talked about that a while ago, chapter 1, verse 5. Adopted as sons and daughters in Christ. This has all happened in the beloved, in Jesus. Jesus is God's darling of heaven. He's the son of his love. He's the, the beloved means that, the son of my love. And we're in him. And God loves us unconditionally, absolutely, irrevocably, because we're in his beloved. Been redeemed in him. His death procured our release, the great exchange. We were under the wrath of God. Paul says in the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5, God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That, that great transaction. We deserved wrath. Jesus endured wrath. And God will not punish twice anyone for whom Jesus endured God's wrath. The great exchange. Redeemed. 
We're given an inheritance in him that's, that's incorruptible, that doesn't fade. And we will get it. We will have it one day. One, one writer I read years ago said, we will, we will come into the presence of the Lord on the last day. And we will be handed the crown, the victor's crown, the, the Stephanus that we have run and finished. And we will take that crown and we will cast our crowns before him. The hymn, Crown Him with Many Crowns, is based upon that picture. The Lamb upon the throne. Mark how the heavenly anthem drowns all music but its own. That picture of our inheritance that's kept for us. No one will devalue it, no one will steal it. Jesus said, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust corrupt, where thieves break in and steal. Rather, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where none of that happens. For where your treasure is, there's your heart also. Stay focused, brothers and sisters. Don't forget that the real inheritance is in the heavenly places, given to us, guaranteed for us. We have hope in him. Look at chapter 1, verse 12. So that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. The first fruits there. The first to hope in Christ. Uses a verb here. Hope many times in the scriptures is a noun, the blessed hope. To have, that, to have that glorious confidence that God will be sure that Jesus will be all for us, that he's promised to be for us, that we will not be disappointed. We're sealed in him. We've talked about that. The stamp of ownership. Made alive together with him. How do we know if we trust in Jesus Christ, we'll be made alive? Look at the tomb, the empty tomb. Just as God raised Jesus from the dead, so he will raise everyone who trusts in him. Seated with him. Seated with him. I don't understand how to work all that out, how a, how a numberless multitude will be seated with Jesus, but you know, that's not a problem for God. We will have a place, a place at the table. Jesus says so. I will not eat of this anymore, he says, until I've gathered you all together in the marriage supper of the Lamb. Then I will share again in this powerful, transformational Passover meal that's become the new covenant meal of the body of Christ. Created. We're a new creation. Kenny Rogers, I used to listen to Kenny Rogers when I was growing up, and he had a song, uh, You Decorated My Life, right? That's not what happened to us. <laughs> we, haven't had some, we haven't had a renovation even, a recreation. We are new. The old things have passed away, Paul says in Corinthians. Behold, all things become new. And that's, that's who Jesus is for us. Brought near by his blood. In chapter 2, if you're familiar with it, when you move beyond verse 10, that we were aliens. We were strangers. We, we didn't have any of the promises. We, distanced from the commonwealth of Israel. But we've been brought near by his blood, by his, by his bloody, horrific death. We who had no claim now can claim, be part of the family of God. Growing in Christ. Because of Jesus Christ's life, death, burial, and resurrection for us and the Spirit coming to apply that gospel to us, we are growing. We've talked about this before. Salvation in its tenses. You have been saved. If you're saved here tonight, you have been saved from the penalty of sin. That's justification. If you're saved here tonight, you are being saved from the power of sin. That's what he's talking about here. Growing into a holy temple of the Lord. And, of course, glorification when we leave this earth and go to that perfect place, that, that land that is fairer than day, where the Lamb is all the glory of Emmanuel's land, we'll be saved from the very presence of sin. And that will be glory indeed. We've been made partakers of the promise. Everything that God has promised into, to Jesus becomes a promise to us in Jesus. 
because of his life, death, burial, and resurrection. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, just by grace through faith, not by becoming proselyte Jews. Even when the prophets spoke what they spoke about the family of God being expanded, it never occurred to them that that would happen apart from the nations becoming Jews first. And the mystery of the gospel is that Gentiles, as Gentiles, as non-Jews, can be saved by God's grace, made fellow heirs, members of the same body, partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel, and then given access through faith in him, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence. This is some of the things that Paul teaches to these, these Ephesians, primarily non-Jewish Christians, that is theirs in Christ. That's true for us as well. Well, let me wrap it up. The contribution of Ephesians to the, to the body of Scripture. If you remember from last week, Galatians, very personal and controversial letter. I'm sure Josh told you this. When you read Galatians, <laughs> Paul is, has such a righteous anger he writes in incomplete sentences some places. He is so stupefied that they would so soon depart from the, the simple gospel of free grace and begin to, to let the Judaizers influence them. Ephesians is not a letter like that. It's formal. It's more impersonal in its style. It's non-controversial in its subject matter. There's really two things, only two things Paul tells us about himself in Ephesians. Very unusual. That he's in prison and why he's sending Tychicus to them. So Tychicus can help, can, can relieve their concern and let them know what's going on, how they're doing. And that's as far as you're going to get to anything personal about Paul in the letter to the Ephesians. And then... The last thing that I found interesting is this benediction. Look at chapter 6, verses 23 to 24. It's, it's third person. Paul's benediction is normally your second person, to you. Listen to this, this benediction. Peace be to the brothers, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. It's an unusual benediction for him. One that would be designed and very fit to be at the end of a letter shared with several churches in Asia. Ephesians stylistically has a rich vocabulary. Chapters 1 to 3, Paul intertwines theology and worship, which is the way it ought to be. Those two things should never be separated. My friend Ernie Reisinger, who, who founded, who really was the, was the beachhead, the brainchild of Founders Ministries, said to us, men, doctrine and devotion always, never separate them. Word and spirit always, never separate them. And so in, you see this in Ephesians, worship and theology are intertwined. And some people, some of the rest of the day I said, said that they believe it is the most profound book in the New Testament for its content and its message. And that's a little more expansive overview of Ephesians than we got in eight or nine minutes on a video a while ago. Any questions or comments?